Welcome to Our Sport. I'm your host, Larry. John, as always, doing the recording, editing, and providing occasional commentary. So in this episode, we're going to talk about Don Shula. Now, a lot of people have passed away since we started recording our first episode, and we really would have liked to have talked about all of them. We're talking about the NFL and in college. And, uh, you know, a lot of, for time purposes, we didn't get to really hardly any of them. But we can't skip Don Shula. He was just too prominent uh, a face of the NFL. He was too important in its history. And I don't like uh, and viewers who've watched the show regularly, both of you, uh, will know that I don't like definitive lists greatest. This is the greatest of all time. Greatest coach, greatest quarterback, etc. And it's not because I don't like it as a concept. I don't think people really do enough research. A lot of people that make uh, these lists that have these opinions. Now, when you have like a list of greatest coaches of all time in the history of the NFL, Shula's got to be on that list. And Shula has at least a case to be the greatest coach of all time. It's a difficult case. He's got so much competition. And that's probably going to be one of our episodes one time. Uh, which sounds a little hypocritical, you know, because saying, saying that I don't like those lists, but we're going to put our research behind it when we do our own. Let's talk about him. He was born in Ohio to Hungarian parents, and um, he graduated from John Carroll University, and he got drafted by the Browns, and so he learned under Paul Brown. That is a great place to learn how to be a coach. That man could be one of the, the greatest coach of all time. So, and this was a smart man. Shula had degrees in three different fields. Okay, so he was an educated man, and when he was playing, people could see ahead of time that he was going to be a coach. He was a defensive play caller from a defensive back position, really unusual at the time, may have been the first. So eventually, Shula gets his chance with the Baltimore Colts, and he takes over a, a terrible team, and immediately, they're, they're successful. Immediately, they have winning seasons. Shula coached 33 years. He had only two losing seasons in 33 years. He didn't have any Baltimore. Now, the problem was, and Shula said this, he was a young coach, and so he was still making mistakes. He still didn't know exactly what he was doing. Um, well, that's sort of, he knew what he was doing well enough to have winning records all the time and be in playoff contention. I think what he meant is like to take the final step because they had games where, in Baltimore, they were favored against the Browns one get, uh, game in the playoffs, and they got blown out by the Browns. And, of course, the infamous game against Joe Namath, that Baltimore team was – Statistically, one of the best teams in NFL history would have gone down that way if it wasn't for Namath upsetting them in Super Bowl III. So the Colts' ownership got sick of it. And they really were uh, not too much against the idea of him leaving. They thought he could. he's a close-but-no-cigar kind of coach. Well, here come the Dolphins. In their short history, really had not had any success. And Joe Robbie, the owner, was starving for success, starving for respectability. And he plucked Shula out of there. And Shula, again, I think he took over a 3-10 and 10 team, immediately got them to 10-4 and four and in the playoffs. Um, but then he loses the Super Bowl to the Dallas Cowboys, an ugly game in 1971. And it looks like more of the same. It looks like more of the, the kind of cold syndrome, a close but no cigar kind of thing. Well, the next year was legendary. The next year, not only does Shula win the Super Bowl, and validate everything that Goodo said about him. They go, as everybody watching this podcast right now, I'm sorry, uh, channel knows right now, they go undefeated. They're 17-0. To this day, in 100 years of professional football, still the only undefeated team. Now, there are some people who, um, who kind of knock it a little bit. They try to find holes in that resume. Uh, the, the schedule wasn't that great. The, the slate of teams they've played, they're still professional teams. You know, if you played 14 games against an Arizona Cardinals type of schedule, the, that modern equivalent of that team, you still have to win all of them, and that's still unlikely in this league. Even teams like the Cardinals won four or five games a year. They won all theirs, and then they won all their playoff games. You have to give them credit for that. You can't just dismiss that and say, well, their schedule was too easy. So Shula validates that. Um, the concerns about him, and then the next year, 1973, they won a Super Bowl again. So there's no doubt now. This is, at that point, considered one of the best coaches in all the NFL. You look at his coaching tree, and Chuck Knoll for the Pittsburgh Steelers was an assistant under him in Baltimore. Howard Schnellenberger, uh, who became the head coach of Miami, became another legend in that town on the college level, uh, was his offensive coordinator for a while. So he could not only coach players, he could coach coaches. Now his style... He's tough. He's a disciplinarian. 
Uh, he believed in a lot of that, very rigid, and it was very much, he, they were going to do it the way he wanted to do it. And you look at the hallmarks of one of his teams, and this was all the way throughout his coaching tenure, and they were never a fat team. They didn't have offensive linemen with big guts. Those guys were always in shape. Weight was important to him. You, you can't play well with extra weight. You can't play well when you have a, a big belly hanging out of your jersey. He believed in it. Um, and, and if you look at him, he was in pretty good shape for his age the whole time. He kind of practiced what he preached. Now, this tells you a lot about the man. He was regarded as classy. He was regarded as someone who was genuine, who did things the right way, who was not a liar, was not a cheater. Um, say what you want about the Patriots and Bill Belichick, and I'm not, I'm not knocking what they've done, but nobody ever called Don Shula a cheater. Nobody ever accused him of that. And he was kind of regarded that way, like I said, as a, as a classy figure to, to this point even. When he won his game, that uh, the 325th victory, it was against the Philadelphia Eagles. It set the record for most coaching wins in the history of professional football. He beat George Hallis. His players didn't throw Gatorade on him. They said, you know what? The way he acts, they, they, they felt like he almost had like a regal aspect to him. So this man is just became the winningest coach of all time. You don't want to see him look like a wet rat. So they did not pour Gator in on him, but they sure put him on their shoulders and they carried him off the field. He had a lot of respect from his players. Um, his players felt a lot of endearment from, for him. You hear a lot of stories about that, a lot of respect from him about how he treated them, how he cared about them. Now, another thing about Shula, very, very sound in terms of a great coach uses what he has. The 72 team, the early 70s team, they were just a dominant run team because they had a great offensive line, and three great backs. Well, that was just him playing to his talents, him playing to the strengths of his team. He gets he says, uh, Dan Marino in 1983 in that draft, and he totally pivots. He totally becomes the opposite of what it had been, which is they're going to throw the ball everywhere. Because it probably took one practice of seeing Dan Marino to realize, oh my God, look at the talent on this guy. And then the fans all saw it. The ball explodes out of his hands, the whiplash release, the cannon arm, the way he just carves up defenses. And Marino starts the second half of the 83 season. Does great, like 20 touchdowns and six interceptions in half a season. The next year, he throws for 5,000 yards and 48 touchdowns. Now, a 5,000-yard season to this day is not that commonplace. It's not unheard of. Drew Brees has what, four of them, John? Drew Brees is the only one who has more than one. He's the only actually. one that has more. And Drew Brees has like seven. He has a lot. Drew Brees Drew is Brees great. Is good, yeah. But nobody was doing this back then. Dan Marino was the first, and somebody had to be the first, but then nobody had another 5,000-yard season for like 20 years. It was all him. That's how great he was. And Shula just unleashed him. And they went to the Super Bowl in Marino's second year and lost to really a better team, uh, the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, Bill Walsh, Joe Montana, they were not beating that team. Uh, Ronnie Lott, too many good players. Now, here's what I think really kind of hurt Shula's career toward the end. He had more and more control over personnel. And Shula and Belichick's like this to a certain extent too. As great as a coach as he is, he is not the greatest personnel man. And their talent started to dip some. So they went from being basically a 12-4 and four level team to a 10-6, and 9-7 level team because they're, they were not going to be a 5-11 team. He's just too good. And they did have some good players. They had drafted Richmond Webb. They hit on John Offerdahl, but man, that dude was always hurt. But when Offerdahl, uh, the linebacker, I mean, when Offerdahl was healthy, he was an all-pro. He was just never healthy. So they would hit occasionally, but they did not have enough hits coming out of college in the draft. Also, and... You know, they had kind of a revival in 1990. Halfway through the year, the Dolphins had the number one defense in the NFL. But that year, uh, the Bills emerged. And the Bills were in their division. And the Bills were a much more complete team. Marino really never had a 1,000-yard rusher um, under Shula, which hurt him. Look how much it helped John Elway when he got Terrell Davis. You gave him a running game to take the pressure off of him to force huge holes in the defense and a passing game through play action. He never had that, so Marino had to carry the team by himself and still made the playoffs about every year. But here come the Bills. And their Hall of Fame quarterback, Jim Kelly, who I know he's in a Hall of Fame. I'm sorry, I've seen him play. He's not in the same universe as Dan Marino. But he had a Hall of Fame receiver. He had a Hall of Fame back. He had Hall of Famers on defense. 
And that helps your quarterback as much as players on his side of the ball because you don't have to score 35 points to win a game. They were a more complete team. And the Bills go to four straight Super Bowls, really control that division. And as well as the Dolphins played, they could not overcome that team. So toward the end, that was happening in Mario's career and the end of Shula's career. He still went out well regarded. He still went out in style. He was very much celebrated when he retired. And John is going to post a, a short clip of kind of a well-known story about him that tells you about his character and integrity. He's going to put it right after I speak. And this is not a, a, um, a story that only a few people know about. It's, it's well-known, but it tells you a lot about the man and his character. And John's going to play it right here. He always looked for an edge, but he would never cheat. He hated it when he heard rumors of other teams maybe cheating, but he was about integrity and winning the right way. Once in Oakland, we went in and used their locker room because the other locker room, something was going on the day before the game. I'm in a locker that belongs to an Oakland Raider. I open it, and there's the game plan. There's what they're going to do to try to defeat us tomorrow. I hand it to Monty Clark, who's our offensive line coach. He's walking by. I said, Monty, look at this. Give this to Coach Shula. The following day, Miami lost to Oakland. I see Monty a week later. I said, Monty, what was the deal? You know, we ended up losing with the Raiders. What, you know, what's the deal? You didn't give So Coach Shula said, throw it away. He said, throw it away. When you've got their stuff and you know what to do, that's cheating. Shula won't cheat. He's got integrity. The great Don Shula passes away at 90 years old. Hi, it's John here to do the outro. Thank you for watching this episode of Our Sport. This is our commemoration of Don Shula, truly a football great. Uh, our thoughts and prayers grow out to him and his family, but he's he had a very full life. He died at 90 years old, uh, but he we did want to pay respects to, to him and his, his very, very successful career in the NFL. Uh, if you like this video, don't forget to hit the like button down below. And if you learned something, um, if you want to see more of our content, we should be posting weekly now. Uh, you can hit the subscribe button and the notification bell for whenever we upload. Uh, if you have a recommendation of something for us to talk about, whether it be coach, player, any topic, you can comment it down below. And we're still relatively small right now, so we'll probably be able to get to it in anything that you, uh, you post for us to do. And uh, if you want more ways to come into contact with our sport, we have our Facebook page, Twitter page, Gmail. They should all be in the description box down below. And uh, as always, thank you for watching.